Hi everyone. Beautiful to connect with you from all over the world. And yeah, I started to get lit up last night, but I'm really lit up today. I, I, I think it's, we're in for a blazing session today. You know how yesterday I said that, you know, the thing that really lights me the most up is not uh, theology and metaphysics, it's actually practical application. To me, if you can't put this into practice, really what good is it? What good is another theology? What good is another uh, thought system? If you can't live it, if you can't put it into practice, then you know, that's a real practical question. What good is it? What value does it have for you? You know, even if you read the Course and you go, sentimentally, I agree with it, does that really help you in your day-to-day -day life, uh, sentimentally <laughs> agreeing with something, you know? Or is it just another thought system that you find you're drawn to, but you still are afraid of it, or you're resisting the Spirit, or you're defending against uh, your awakening. So I think uh, this afternoon, uh, or depending where you are in the world, this movie, Take Me Home, it will show you, that's going to be a very experiential exercise for you, because you're going to get to watch everything I talk about put into practice in a, in a very direct way, and just watch your emotions and watch your reactions to that experience. I think when I look through the questions uh, and the prayers that you've written, I am so very touched. I just feel like you are all with me and I can just feel your hearts in everything that you write. And a lot of times I just, I, I read through these expressions that you write, uh, it's, it's just tears of joy that come because I can feel your deep calling to follow God and your deep calling for happiness and joy that's underneath the questions and underneath the prayers. And that brings tears to my eyes because, you know, we are entitled to miracles, we are entitled to know true innocence, we are entitled to happiness and joy, and, and we really have to be very uh, direct at facing the obstacles in our own mind. You know, most of us have tried to play the ego's game of pointing the finger, blaming the world, blaming our circumstances, blaming our situations, blaming our environment, you know, bl bl blame game, uh, and justifying all the reasons why we can't do it. And then we come into a, a point where we just go, you know, enough of that game. I'm enough, I've, I've had enough justifying why I, I'm not happy. I have enough uh, justifying why I'm not feeling joy and peace. It's time for me to uh, to kick this uh, awakening into gear in a in a gentle way of of just being very prayerful. And so when I read your your expressions, you know, I just feel these tears of uh, oh, I I want everything that I share to be an a, a healing bomb, and I wanted to give your mind inspiration and spark that willingness to, to really go for it. And what I mean by go for it is just like a, a letting go in the mind. It's not like you have to be some kind of Joan of Arc character or John the Baptist. You don't have to go find your nearest river and, and go cry out, Repent! I am calling you sinners out of the world! You know, you don't have to do anything radical like that, but but it is radical enough when you start to let go of, of these limitations and fears and resistances in your mind. Now that's radical. And the ego will get stirred up in a big way if you start feeling love and start following your function. I'll, I'll guarantee you this is, this is radical to the ego. Well, Francis is joining in and, you know, the thing that's so beautiful about Frances, she will be sharing some, I think, this morning from from Mexico. But but Frances is one who, like, if you had an encyclopedia of, and it just said answering the call, <laughs> Frances's picture would be in there because many of your questions are like, I really am praying to have a spiritual awakening, and yet I have all these obstacles, whether they're 
career obstacles, whether they're ambitions in the world obstacles, whether they're family obstacles, whether they're obstacles regarding a, a, a partner, a marriage partner or a partner, whether there's issues you feel are like health issues that relate to the body. I'm, I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I'm, I have symptoms. Um, there's just so many things the ego throws up to try to get your attention to keep you from really questioning who you believe you are, questioning your perception, and questioning what you believe. The ego doesn't want you to question it, because ultimately if you question it, it will dissolve and it will disappear. It's by not questioning it, by just accepting death as real, by accepting pain and suffering and sickness and and pursuits in the world as real and not questioning the ego. That's how the ego is maintained. So it, it's a self-perpetuating belief system, but it can't even exist unless you give your mind to it. You made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. That's a direct line from Jesus in A Course in Miracles. You made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So this morning is going to be filled with practical examples and, and lots of uh, examples for you of using the parable of the world to say, you can do this. There is nothing really that has the power to stop you because your mind still has the power of God in it. And if you chose the ego, you can unchoose the ego. If you chose the detour into time and space, you can unchoose that detour. You can choose the wake-up call instead of the blame game. Instead of staying stuck in time and space, you can actually say, no, this is my wake-up call. I'm not in this retreat by accident. You could say, I am here because there's a deep calling inside me to know the Holy Spirit, to communicate with the Holy Spirit, to receive instructions from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and to wake up from this dream. And before I wake up, I'm going to be having a happy dream, a dream of non-judgment, a dream of, of wholeness and inclusion, and, and good. Isn't that good to know? That's what you've got in store for you before the wake up is the happy dream. In fact, I would say that's the goal of the, the Course, is just to forgive and have a happy dream where you stop judging, and you, you learn how to accept all things exactly as they are. That's really the goal of the Course. Love is so vast, it cannot be taught. It, it cannot be learned or taught. It's just what is. And God is so vast that, that just to even invoke the name God, if you really give yourself over to that, then all tiny little things of time and space go into a hush. There's a hush. That's a carpenter song. There's a kind of hush all over the world tonight. It's the sound of being in love. And, and there's a hush to the tiny, raspy little sounds of the ego. The ego is silent in the presence of, of love because the ego doesn't exist in the presence of love. <laughs> It doesn't have a voice because it doesn't even have an existence. Perfect love casts out fear, the Bible says. That's true. So, what I wanted to start off with, with these examples, is, is first of all, sometimes, like, Francis and I are, are here sharing this movie with you, and we're sharing this retreat, and sometimes people uh, like to call us names like, teachers of God or other names, <laughs> and uh, some of them are complimentary, some of them may be something else, but actually what, what a symbol is in this world is nothing more than a pointer. You know, like the, the Zen master talking about the Zen master pointing to the moon, and then people start describing the Zen master, and look at that finger, and what does the finger mean, and which finger is he using, and all kinds of things like this. And actually he's just pointing to the light. That's all it is. It's just David and Francis and all the characters you'll see in the movie today. They're just symbols for your mind that are able to be used by the Holy Spirit to point you to the light. 
the truth within. There's nothing special about a messenger, there's nothing special about a teacher, and uh, Klaus uh, raised the concept in his questions of the guru. I remember years ago, because I was you know, into the Course, but I was studying a lot of the Eastern Masters and the teachings of the Masters of the Far East and, you know, Ramana Maharshi and Yogananda and all kinds of lineages. I, I was opening my mind to all kinds of spiritualities. And the best thing I ever heard was when the idea of Guru came up, I heard it was the message of Guru was simply this, G. You are you. <laughs> that's, that's the message of the Guru. You are you. You've always been you. I mean, the, the innocent, perfect you. Gee, you are you. That's all it means. It's not a person. It's not an avatar. It's not a saint. It's not some character. Because people don't become enlightened. The you that you are, the you that I am, the you that we all are is spirit. And that spirit never comes into form. It can be reflected in form. It was certainly reflected by Jesus, uh, spectacularly, actually. Uh, and, but Jesus' message really wasn't like, worship me as a person, or worship me as an avatar, or as a messiah, as a personal savior. He was saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I live in you right now. We are the same Christ. We are the same one. God, God created us in perfect love. Don't get caught up in the man 2,000 years ago. You're the living Christ right now, and you need to remember that. You need to forgive the world so you can wake up to remember your true divine identity. That's why the kingdom of heaven is at hand, because when Jesus was speaking, that was the Holy Spirit speaking through Jesus, and the presence of love is very close always very close. It's who we are. It can't be any closer than that. But a hand is very, very close in terms of the body metaphor. Now, one of the values you'll, you'll get to see in the movie is that Frances shared she was just called, had a dream, she was called, a movie would be made, she would be involved with, but the movie was already made. She just had to be patient and wait, and then when the time came, just let the whole symbol of the movie be used as a letting go, like seeing that she's not really in charge of anything, and that, that everything will happen effortlessly, like she was talking about, and there's no need for like striving and fighting and, and working so hard. If you really learn to let go and let God, you'll find that there's nothing more relaxing and nothing more simple. Also, I can tell you too, ever since I met Francis in the parable of David and Francis when I was over in uh, Australia, that Francis simply said yes, and she answered the call. When I said, let's join together, she simply said yes, and she didn't waver about it. She, she had a lot of the same things. There's a lot of things written on these pages about about family, did Francis have family? Yes, Francis had a mother, sister. She had a, a family from from Beijing. Uh, did Francis have a career? Yes, she had a career. She had worked in different positions. She was a business owner. Did Francis have a relationship? Yes, she had a husband. Uh, did Francis have what seems to be a worldly life established? Yes, and she had had one there in, in China and Beijing, and then studied in uh, the United States in the University of Chicago, and then she had established this, what seemed to be a life in the world, but all of it is the self-concept. Everything we perceive in time and space is a, is a self-concept that was made to take the place of your Christ spiritual identity. So, it's not the particulars that are the problem, it's it's the belief in time and space that's the problem. <laughs> it's the entire cosmos. It's the entire, it's the stars, it's the planets, it's the, it's the black holes, it's the quasars, it's the galaxies, it's the mountains, it's the lakes, it's the rivers, it's the people. And it's the personal identification with that whole construct that is 
a, a veil drawn over the light within you. It's a veil, as it says in the Matrix, it's a veil drawn over your eyes to blind you from the truth. That's what the Matrix is, and the Matrix is the whole cosmos. So when we try to solve it at the level of the person, through interpersonal relationships, doesn't work. We try to th solve it through correcting the body, correcting the behaviors, morality, ethics, doesn't work. It, it, it certainly keeps us occupied, but it ultimately doesn't provide the release. When we try to do it through ambitions and careers and make the world a better place and heal the world and heal the planet, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. None of it works. Some of you have tried some of these things, so you can, you probably can, are nodding, going, yep, I've been there, done that. I, I tried that. I tried saving the whales, saving the planet. Still not happy. I tried, uh, you know, healing my body. Still not happy. I tried for this special relationship with my soulmate. Still not happy. It just doesn't work. And so, at every point along the way, for myself and for Francis, simply we had guidances coming in where if we would follow the guidance, there was something in our mind, that, like a chunk of ice on an iceberg, that would just shoom, fall away. Every time we followed the guidance to empty our mind, to take the next step that the Holy Spirit and Jesus were giving us, things fell away. And and those things involve all the concepts that I have referred to. If you think that you're just going to be able to be a spiritual person, if that's your goal to be a spiritual person, the course is not your course. You, you, you probably should get out now if, if the goal is, uh, is to make yourself a spiritual person. If you think spiritualizing matter, and that's what a person is, it's material, if you think spiritualizing matter is going to happen, you're, you're going to be uh, disappointed. But actually, even then, you'll start to realize, well, wait a minute, I, don't really, I didn't sign up for an intellectual concept of enlightenment. I didn't sign up for a concept of salvation. I actually want to be happy. I actually want to be joyful and peaceful, and I actually want to go for it, meaning I want to empty my mind of all thoughts and all concepts so that only the light remains. I would let go of all idols, I would let go of all fantasies, I would let go of all images so that I can merge into the light of the Christ that I am, that God created me as, the perfect living Christ. So. For Francis and I, you could say we took our steps, and those steps were steps in the mind, and they were simply steps of, this is next, uh, and chunks of self-concept seemed to fall away with every decision that we made. Can you do this? Of course you can. It's inevitable. Can you seem to delay it? Yes, you know, if, you, if you're if you kind of on the fence with it and you're not quite sure where this is all heading and you're quite afraid of the light, then the ego will give you lots of ways to slow down and distract yourself away from the light. Uh, this whole cosmos is, I call it sometimes Distractionville, and if you want to play around in Distractionville, you know, you can. It's not going to bring you the reward that that the Course, the Bible, that all spiritualities talk about. It won't bring you to a state of, of knowing God, but it will just delay the inevitable. Eventually, if God created you perfect, you can delay, but you can't, you can't deny what is so. You can't really deny love. In fact, um, I was reading through a lot of the things today, and, and one of the things that I came to was... Um, I believe it was uh, Elenique, uh who talked about, it wasn't too long ago, that her, her son passed away. And then, actually, she came to a point where she, she had his voice come into her mind in a dream and basically say, Mom, love is all there is. Love is all there is. 
And Elanique, you've been, you were on a, a pathway since you were a little girl, wanting to know God and wanting to love God and somewhere deep in your mind knowing that that's the whole purpose behind this whole world, is to, to know God. And so you, when the, with the passing of your, your son, your 11-year-old son, and with that voice coming to you, you really took that as a wake-up call, like, it's, it's time for me to ascend, ascend to who I really am. You know, there's a lot of ways people can react to the loss of a child, and through the lens of loss, there can be enormous grief and so forth, but you actually took this and that voice of your son coming to you as a, as a sign, like, it's time. It's time now to, to ascend to, to who I truly am. This is important because we actually have another friend who's writing in from Australia named Udestra. And, and I actually went to Australia and I was down there in southern Australia and Udestra invited me to his house and where he and his father lived. And, and he was, I, I stayed with him and we lived together and we ate together and basically it was, there you are, oh, my buddy, my beloved brother, we're reunited here. And, and he took me right in, and I got to meet his father, and listen to his father, and have a beautiful holy encounter. And Udestra is going through an experience where his son, as well, was taken away in his dream, his perception of the dream. So here we have two situations where Udestra is talking, and he's, he's seeing that Basically, his son has been uh, eliminated to a great extent um, from his dream world. He's not, his son is not so much in his dreamscape anymore in terms of his perception. You think about your son quite frequently, I would say, much during the day. And here we have Elanique, whose son uh, was also taken from, from the dreamscape. And, and yet, what I find helpful with both of you is you both have poured your hearts out and you've written in and yet the question really still remains is what is this a symbol of and, and what is the purpose underneath this? For myself, I've had many things that have disappeared from my perception and it, and it can involve people and many different places and um, many, many different aspects of the dreamscape have disappeared, but underneath I had this faith that there was nothing happening by accident, that anything that appeared or disappeared in my awareness was all for my awakening, that, that I was not truly harmed by what was happening or what I perceived, but actually what was happening was for me. It wasn't that these events were happening against me or to me, but these things were happening for my mind's benefit. And I think that that's what I, with Elanique, when you said you were called, that this is my calling to ascend, that is really the, the interpretation that's underneath everything that seems to occur in our life. Whether a child dies, whether a child's taken away by the their parent, the other parent, or the court, or, or some uh, decree, or some circumstance, whether we seem to lose a job, or a house, or somebody steals money from our bank account, or something happens in the world, we simply have to come back to this thing of, what is the purpose here? Obviously, nothing would even seem to be occurring in the dream, unless it has some kind of symbolic, helpful value. So, for myself, when things would fall away, I would always go into deep prayer and I would say, show me the meaning. And Jesus would always say, I'm clearing your path, I'm clearing your mind, I'm orchestrating time and space to free your mind. Like, you know, Neo asking, you know, Morpheus in the Matrix, what is the purpose of this? And, and Morpheus saying, I'm trying to free your mind. 
every time I would have an event and have some kind of an emotional reaction to what my interpretation or perception was, I would really hear Jesus saying, stay with me, I'm trying to free your mind. You're attached, you're so attached to these images. God did not create these images, but you're so involved, you give so much false meaning to these images, and you're so wrapped up and addicted to the images, but I am with you. Be of good cheer, I am with you. I will free your mind. Trust me, I will free your mind. And so, when things for myself, for Francis, like family self-concepts start to dissolve away like dusts into thin air, uh, careers things, concepts start to fall away like dust in thin air. Things that we thought were important, like certain kind of intellectual ideals that, that we had hoped for, ambitions we had hoped for in our worldly life, they start to fall away like dust and disappear. Everything starts to disintegrate as the mind integrates. It's, it, it works together. It's a disintegration of the ego and an integration of the mind. So you come to this beautiful, holistic perception. You're no longer interested in the pieces of the puzzle. You want to see the big picture. You want to see the whole thing. You're a child of God. You're entitled to see the whole thing. You don't have to live in a tiny little space in your mind with holding on to little self-concepts that God didn't even create and doesn't even know they even exist, you, you don't have to cling to those. You can free yourself and let your mind soar. Many of the questions that you've written in have involved family, they've involved profession, they've involved, uh, let's see, what's another thing? Oh, you're coming close to a leaping off point, but for some reason, the personality self is still pretty prominent in your mind. And so there's a, there's a little hesitation there, like you're coming close to a leaping off point where you're really ready to take, take a dive with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And you know the water, you know, you're looking at the pool and you're like looking and, and Jesus, Holy Spirit is saying, come on, jump in, dive in, the water's warm. You're going to love it. You come here for a swim with me. Swim with me and you will never tinker around with the images of the world again. You, you come swimming in spirit and you're going to wonder, how could I have devoted so much mind effort to staying in the tinker toys when this beautiful lush pool of love and light was always there beckoning me, saying, come on, come on over here. I'm here. I'm still here. We're still here. We haven't gone anywhere. You know? We're still here. So, I'd like to actually go through today and, and address you and address some of the things that you have written in. And, and I thank you, Yudestra, and, and thank you, uh, Elenique, for what you wrote in, because I totally join you. I know that, that you wrote, wrote in, Elenique, because now you're ready to be activated into your life's calling. That's what ascension is. You, you are ready. And also, Yudestra, when I read what you wrote uh, about your son, I just, I feel your heart. I, I feel your heart. Yudestra was writing in uh, because uh, he's lost custody of his son and uh, he hasn't seen him for over a year now. And uh, it's also a lot of uncertainty. He doesn't know when or if he will ever see his son again. It's, it was through a, a, a judge's order or a, an order that came through uh, and with his ex. Basically, Udestra writes, but when it comes to my son, I just feel so sad. Not something I can describe and I don't know what to do about it. I've taken all the practical steps I can. I accepted the order. The alternative was to contest it. I got legal advice, attempted mediation, which failed, and I don't know why, for reasons of confidentiality, and I worked 
a course as best as I can, instrument for peace, levels of mind, workbook lessons, videos. Everything helps a little bit, but the sadness is still there. I just miss my son and I worry about him. I don't know how he is, where he is, what he is doing, and I just don't understand why any of this even happened. It makes very little sense to me. None, really. Life just seems so different now. More just existing. Little enthusiasm. I sleep a lot. Often tired. I don't look forward to much. Feels like a surreal bad dream and I don't see a way out. Just more of the same. And I have had enough. I am sick of it, but I can't seem to shake it. So, I'm bringing this up and I'm using your example, Yudastra, because this is exactly what the ego wants us to feel, depressed. What does Jesus have to say about depression? Jesus says, depression comes from being deprived of something you want and do not have. He also says, this is from Jesus, remember, you are deprived of nothing except by your own decision, and then decide otherwise. So, this thought about your son is not really a thought about the Son of God. <laughs> I'll guarantee you, if you were thinking about the Son of God every day, <laughs> and I like to think about the Son of God, it's who I am, so I actually think about it a lot. I'm so grateful, I, can, I just keep throwing praises up to the Heavenly Creator for creating me this way, as a Son of God, as a perfect, innocent Son of God. And I am so enraptured in joy that I cannot even speak of these things. And I know for you, you're saying, it, I'm so sad that it's hard for me to speak of this. You know, it's almost like the words now, it's almost like, ah, why bother? It's like it's... It's like a deep, dark pit. But I'm telling you that this is a self-concept that the ego made up. And all of the things you feel, all the memories associated with your biological son, all of those things are part of a package of linear time memories that are meant to keep you depressed. Because underneath those memories there's still this feeling of deprivation. I've, I've lost something dear to me, I'm deprived of something dear to me. And who created the biological son? Well, you may say you and your, your partner, your ex-wife, you know, no, no, that's projection. This world is projection. Creation is spirit. God creates in spirit. Christ creates in spirit. There's a spiritual reality that's real and true. It's here and it's now. It's, it's for us to behold. And that's the only purpose that there is for this world, is to forgive it and to experience that spiritual reality. God wills perfect happiness. God wills joy. God wills peace of mind. And depression is one of those ego tricks where We've, we've bought into this belief in deprivation, that somehow we're deprived of something that we don't have. And Jesus is saying, if you will give me your mind, and you will follow me, and you will align with me, I will give the world back to you. Everything that the ego made, I will light it up. I will light it up in, in such a joyful dreamscape, that the characters will turn to you, and the leaves will bow down before you, and everything in this world will turn to greet the Holy Son of God. Everything without exception. Because of who you are. You are the One, as, as uh, Morpheus told Neo in The Matrix. You are the One. And Neo had a bit of difficulty accepting that at first, you know. Why is this happening to me? Remember on the, on the scene on the, the roof? Why is this happening to me? I didn't ask for this. And no, you know, he's, he's actually in his resistance, even though Morpheus is trying to help him take a first step and guide him out of that cubicle where he works nine to five and, 
And Morpheus says, you're, worth, you're so much more than this 9 to 5 job. You're so much more than a biological father. If you knew how vast the real you is, this biological father concept and biological son would look like two ants that were playing on the ground under a tree. And you would, you would look down and you would go, wow, wow, I once believed I was one of those ants. Good heavens, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But that's why we're here. We're here for the practical application of taking the steps and being guided and listening and following. And Frances was down right, right about where you are. She, she had her worldly life and her concepts, and every time Jesus would light up in her mind and give her a concept and say, here, this is for you now. Francis said yes every single time. And now, Francis, oh, let, we have to hear from you. We just want to see your face and the strength that comes from behind your face, from you just saying yes to all these prompts, and it never seriously occurred to you to say no to any of them. And to me, that's the... that's. That's what I went through too. I thought this must be the same for everybody. If you if you see the road that goes to the light, why wouldn't you take it? But maybe you can just share because your gesture is right. He's down in Australia, right about the same place in time and space where you were uh, about eight or nine years ago. Yeah. 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 Thank you, David, and thank you, Destro. I mean. Um, well, I don't even know where to start. I feel like, <laughs> you know, David, you mentioned a little bit that um, you know, some people right now, you know, can see us as um, the teacher of God, or that, that, that is actually a term that Jesus uses in his manual for teachers. And he said, who, who are the teachers of God? And he answered, anyone who chooses to be one. So um, there is no... There is actually no criteria that is put by any external situation or any external conditions. And he said, yeah, so he said at some point, someone made a conscious decision to see um, there is no separate interest. And then from that point, the whole path is laid on, is laid in front of him to walk so it sounds like to me, once we make this decision in our mind, the whole pathway was laid in front of us to walk. That pathway is, in his words, happened in time, a long time ago. In reality, ne never at all. So it's like, it's not, in, in whichever way you look at it, it's not a present decision. The pathway has laid out, and then, we are only making decision in present moment as to how to look at it over and over and over again, who to look at, upon it over and over again. And I feel like, yeah, I have this, this uh, memory came to mind this morning when, um, when I first decided to leave Australia and come to America to go through this mind training um, I really felt the experience that I went through when I opened up to, to A Course in Miracles and especially in a retreat that David came to Australia to facilitate. And then when I decided, okay, this is my calling and I acknowledged that calling, I felt called by this experience and I wanted to, to go on. All of a sudden, the, the family turned on me. Like my mom and my ex-husband joined forces. They started to become as tight as, you know, they, they are so together, and they said things to me that I would never thought I would hear from them, especially saying how selfish, how irresponsib irresponsible, how ridiculous, um, but I think at some point, it was very, very difficult because at that point, I didn't really have the strength in my mind because I haven't really gone through the steps um, that was provided 
by the guidance or by Jesus yet. But in my mind, I remember of you know what really took me through it. Of course, it was this overwhelming um, attraction to to the happiness and to God. But also, I felt if I stay, I would become resentful, and they would be the reason that I'm resentful. And deep down in my heart, I thought I cannot do this to them or to myself. That feels truly irresponsible to decide. To choose to be unhappy, and put the reason on someone else, to lock them in as the victimizer and lock myself in as the unhappy one because of them. So in my heart, I just thought about it. I thought this is the most irresponsible thing I could have done to myself and to them. And I thought I will never make them victimizer for me, and I will never choose to be a victim. Of unhappiness. Now I see what is possible. So from that point on, I felt this desire to be truly loving, and to be truly loving is to refuse to be a victim, and to put them in a position that they don't belong. You know, so that was the moment that I felt I have to do this, even though they say this is the most unloving thing I could have done. Deep down, I know this truly is loving, and I could could I explain to them? No way. There was no reflection in the world that could reinforce this is loving in any way. But deep down, I thought, you know, if I choose to be resentful, to be unhappy, that is unloving. That is the most unloving thing I could have thought of. So that little little flame in my heart just. Said, you know, I have to be responsible for everything, and there is never going to be a reason for me to say I am a victim. So, so I feel just listening to、um, to you and like all the people in our relationship, you know, they can seem to be gone in form, but they can never be gone. In truth, in our mind, and how we perceive them, and what we decide their role to us, you know, is is completely up to us. But I feel the first and foremost thing, the most responsible thing we can do, is to say that I need to be happy. I choose to be happy because if I don't, then I'm making everybody wrong. And I'm going to project this responsibility onto the world to hold myself back. That's why Jesus says, "You're a prisoner, and you hold both in prison. It's a double-sided lock, because they are like limited, you know, a, a, a limited perception of who they are. They're not son of God anymore, and they are the abuser or they are the victimizer. And also at the same time, because of this, I am deserve to be unhappy. So that feels like the the whole underpinning of this world. And I felt in that moment when I decided to go, and with all these projections of why you cannot go, and there is nowhere to go in the ego's mind. There, it, where what are you thinking? How do you think just by going to America things would be you'll be happy? That's ridiculous to think. Like if none of this can make you happy, what do you think can make you happy? But the, the fact is, I I didn't know, you know, from the perspective of, of what else there could be in the outside world that could change to make me happy. But I knew there was an experience and there was a calling, and I know all of you have. Heard that calling because you wouldn't be here. And actually, Jesus said when he said this ancient choice that we have made that seemed to happen in the present moment, right now, he said everybody made a, a decision in the very ancient time. That's why there is no accident, there is no chance meeting. Everybody meet at the exact appointed time. By an ancient decision that we have made, and yet, right now in this present moment, we can choose who to invite to our mind to look at 
this ancient situation. And I feel like that is our responsibility, and that is truly the most loving thing. And I, you know, even that that moment was like a, a defining moment for my journey because I went on this pathway, and I thought deep down somewhere I see through all this attack, and I thought, wow, I know we want the same thing. They want me to be happy. They don't admit it, but I know. So that gave me the strength because I saw we actually are the same. And I would say that is what A Course in Miracle is calling uh, true empathy. We, we see that they're not different than ourselves, despite all the appearances, despite all the you know, the, the seeming thoughts and words, they are the same. They want us to be happy because in that, we free the whole world. We, free, we become free from everything and everyone. And I feel like that was a, definitely a leaping point, like to leap me beyond, you know, just seemingly a, a big step. But I did what I did to just hear the, 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 the prompt and know that is toward true, authentic, loving space. And I'm just moving toward that one step at a time. I don't know exactly how everything will work out in form, but I know in my heart that is a, pl- a place I move toward that feels more loving and more responsible to myself, to everybody. And I feel like in this journey after that, it is the exact same thing I'm doing over and over again in all kinds of situations. It is still the same choice. Do I feel that I want to free all the situation and people to be victimizer? And I, um, from my, free from my, myself from being a victim, and every time I, I reach that point, I don't, want, I don't want these thoughts about them or about myself anymore. Then that is always the moment the prompts are given what to do in order to, to go toward that direction of freedom and of happiness. So, yeah, so I think there's so many um, examples and so many little situations, but... Yeah, I feel like that's that's what came to mind when I w- was hearing you, Destra and David talking. Oh, thank you, Francis, because it's really, you know, I think a core idea that's that all of us have faced is this idea of responsibility, and the one thing that the course and Jesus is really teaching us is that our only responsibility is to accept the atonement for ourselves. In other words to accept the correction for this error called ego. The ego is not a sin. The ego is not some kind of permanent black mark on our soul. It's just a mistake, an error to be corrected. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit, are offering that correction. They're dropping it right down. It's already in our mind where it has always been. But as long as we keep the blame game going, we keep projecting our desire to be special onto characters and situations and and places and environments, we aren't going to be happy. So there's a decision that is available in the mind to see yourself and everyone as innocent. That is the whole point of this course. This course has no other point than the acceptance of that correction. Yes, Jesus knows that the ego made up all these memories to keep us down, to keep us depressed, to keep us angry, to keep us resentful, to keep us filled with hate. And it's just using these images. And Jesus is saying, you don't forgive the people for what they did to you. You have to forgive them for what they did not do to you. You know, the ego just put them there, put these memories out to keep you tempted to think that the images are the ones that are causing your mind to be upset. The images don't make you upset. Your interpretation of the images upsets, but not the images themselves. 
So it's this tweak in the mind that is so, so important. Just recently I saw a beautiful movie based on actual events, and it was called Two Popes. Some of you who have Netflix, you might want to write this down and watch uh, this movie, Two Popes, because it's, it's the story of Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. It wasn't Francis at the beginning, it was Cardinal Francis. <laughs> of course, it was Cardinal uh, Benedict before he became Pope. But it's a big forgiveness movie, and both these men have to face these memories from their past. Both of them are facing the ways that they've compromised, that they didn't really live up to what God called them to. Both need forgiveness, need absolution, and, and, and cannot really fulfill their part in God's plan until they, they do their uh, expression session with each other, until... Yes, that's right, even popes can have expression sessions. <laughs> and they have to empty out their minds, their hurts and their grievances and their memories to come back into their true function for God. It's the same for all of us. And uh, I would say that that's the commonality, that the commonality that we share is we have a very powerful mind that is capable of choosing again that is capable of releasing the meanings that we were so sure defined us. And Jesus is saying, no, those memories, even those memories of, of what you think you did that you shouldn't have done, those memories, those memories of what you should have done that you didn't do, yeah, those memories, all those memories we keep rehashing over and over that we feel guilt about, Jesus is in our mind saying, listen, it's a setup. You, you've been tricked. You've been tricked into this guilt. God didn't create you to be guilty. God didn't create you to be sad or depressed. God didn't create you to have anxiety and stress. God didn't create you. God created you as a beautiful, beautiful, bright, shiny spirit that is an extension of God. And that's who you are now, and that's who you will forever be. But as long as you keep rehashing this, making the same mistake of rehashing this ancient decision from the past, this ancient belief in separation, as long as you keep rehashing that, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to know the joy that God intended for you, that God ever in intends for you. So, I think of myself, I mean, I can give you a little snippet from the parable of David that uh, I remember I went out to a humanistic psychology conference out in La Jolla, California, back in that parable of 1986, and I just finished, I was 10 years of, of university, undergraduate and grad school, and I don't know, I felt like I was just praying, like many of you are praying, that you're just praying for, please show me the way, light my heart up, Show me the direction. I mean, there are so many people that have written in that are just praying for that. I mean, I'm going to just grab one here. Anna Diliberti from New York. You've written, I am so touched that you would take the time to pour everything out that you've poured out, because you have poured your heart and soul out. And... And, I'm, and I, I read it through pages of it, but I love it, because there were so many questions in there, 12, 13 questions, pouring your heart out, telling me exactly everything. And then, the last words here of your second email that you wrote, you said, I wish I could just disappear without a word. Just poof. And that's it. Some days are so peaceful I cry watching a bird fly or staring at a flower, but other days the frustration and sheer madness to feel God is so overwhelming. I am up all night, wreathing some kind of pain, begging for Him to reveal Himself. So, that's what's going on with all of us. Somewhere, subconsciously, 
we actually have this call for God that is so strong that it will not go away. We have tried to push it down out of awareness, we've tried to cover it over, we've tried to distract away from it, but this call to answer and answer God's calling and to wake up and know who we really are, this is so strong that, that it will not go away. And so, when I came across the Course in 1986 and I first opened the book, I, I've said many times it was like waves of love that just washed over me, like a tsunami of love. Almost like I'd been searching, searching so deeply for so long and, and questioning and reading and pondering and contemplating many of the things you talked about, Anna. I was doing that. So that was my first glimpse into there is a better way. There is a, a direct way. There is a, a much more direct, accelerated shot to forgive and to forgive the world and remember who you are. And then I read the book intimately and prayed for several years, and then I was guided to go with some friends to, uh, to a retreat in Monroe, Michigan with Tara Singh, who was a Sikh man from India who was, had given himself over to A Course in Miracles, and he, he was a student of Krishnamurti, uh, so, you know, I, I know you can relate to that. Uh, you know, very devoted. The Course came into his life. I went there. I felt such presence, such stillness, such reverence, that I, it confirmed for me, again, I want to take this Course all the way. I don't, I don't want some kind of a concept, teacher concept. I don't want some kind of a, a, a just another thought system to talk about or so another theology to believe in. I want that reverence, that stillness. And Tara Singh was a beautiful representation for me of that. Then I also started reading the book I had bought along with A Course in Miracles uh, called Forgiveness in Jesus by Ken Wapnick. And I started to get these strong promptings to go visit Ken and his wife Gloria up in the Catskill Mountains. But I was living simple. I didn't really have a bank account. I had no resources. I just had the course book and a lot of willingness and determination. So I, would, I was using the course like an oracle. I was praying every day, miracles. I was having many miracle experiences every day. And then at one point I got this strong prompt. I was driving around uh, what I could afford was a little Volkswagen Rabbit. And I had this little Rabbit I would drive around to Course in Miracles groups and have all my holy encounters with. But it was so rusty that the, the passenger seat in the little Rabbit, the floor had rusted out. And, and there was literally a hole in the floor on the passenger seat of my car. So when I would give my dad my biological father, Jack, a ride, I would say, just put your feet to the sides. I don't want you to fall through the, the car while I'm driving. <laughs> the, the car was so rusty that the, the floor had, had fallen out on the passenger side. So they had to sit in there very carefully. And I remember thinking, this rabbit is going to die. And one day, I got up in the morning and I was reading the Course and doing all my things and Jesus was talking to me and Jesus is like, I'm going to take you on an adventure today, so we're going to a, uh, we're going to a yard sale and he guided me to this little uh, yard sale in Deer Park, a uh, little t town right next to where I lived. So I hopped in my little rabbit and I scurried over there, parked my car on the street, went back in the back. And I walked in the backyard for the yard sale, and the mother and the father and the sister and the brothers all came up to me while I was at the yard sale, and they all stepped saying, we know you. Where do we know you from? Where do we know him from? We know this guy. They all had a recognition, the whole family. And meanwhile, I had all this joyful time in the backyard. That's what happens when you follow Jesus. You have amazing holy encounters with people that before that morning I had never even met. And at the end, they were asking me more and more about things. And I said, well, I was thinking about maybe taking this trip, but, but my, uh, 
my car is in bad shape, and uh, I talk with him a little bit more. And then the, the son, one of the sons said, I have a, a car that's in the garage. Maybe you could take a look at it. So I went back, and it was another tiny little car. It was a Chevy Chevette, and I had my little Volkswagen Rabbit. And I went there, and I looked at it, and then I said, well, I'm, I'll keep that in mind. And they're all, they gave me hugs and everything. I went out to the front yard. My rabbit died. My rabbit died. It died right at that house, right at that yard sale. And I thought, okay, what's going on? I, couldn't, I went back, and they all, oh, you're back again. Hey. I walked back, and I said, my rabbit died, my Volkswagen rabbit. And they go, well, it looks like the, the brother said, looks like you're supposed to have uh, my car then. It, 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 it needs a starter. Uh, it needs a new starter, but uh, I'll, I'll sell it to you for $100. So he sells me a car for $100 at the very moment that my rabbit died. And then he says, well, I'll, we'll push your little rabbit to this uh, mechanics shop, and the guy will probably give you a little bit of money for it. And, and then we'll push the, this little Chevy Chevette to the same mechanic and I will, uh, you pay me the hundred dollars and then you just buy, use it to buy a starter. Basically, I got, I got a car switch. I didn't spend any money. I met all these people that said they loved and adored me that I'd never met before. And I had my little car now to take my trip to see Ken and Gloria Wapnick in the Catskill Mountains. So I drove that little car up and time and space collapsed in that little car. I mean, I drove and drove and drove. I don't know, it's probably like about a, I'm thinking maybe like a 14-hour trip from Cincinnati to uh, Roscoe, New York, the Catskill Mountains. And it's winter and I'm driving and I'm in this $100 car that I've got now and it's cold and snowy and it's icy, and my uh, defroster uh, went out. So I was literally, I put my hat on, I had my gloves on, and I was using the, I had a little scraper. I was scraping the frost off of the inside of the windshield so I could see the road. And I'm just scooting along, and meanwhile, time and space collapse. And before you know it, I'm there. I, I, I'm there. And I get to there, and I, and I got there a day early from when the, the retreat I was attending was supposed to start. So I get there, I look around, and I see this big white building, and I, I drape my little car over there, I hop, I walk in, and I'm in there looking around, and I hear this voice talking, and it's Ken Wapnick. And, and he's leading a retreat, and I've come, time has collapsed, so I'm a whole day early. So I walk right in. And I, I follow his voice, I go over there to where he is, I walk in, and they're just getting ready to take a break. There's a whole group. This whole group has come from Texas because they followed their Course in Miracles teacher from Texas and Oklahoma. His name was Kurt Morrow, and he had just passed away with AIDS, and so the whole group came and Ken is speaking to them, and it's a very intimate experience with all these people. Their beloved teachers passed away, and they're in there. It's nighttime, it's snowy outside, and it's so beautiful. And then they, I walk in, and Ken just looked at me, and, and he just continued teaching, and I just sat there. And then afterwards, uh, I just was there, because I was there a day early, Ken came up to me and he said, Hey, come on, here, I'll help you. And Ken Wapnick took me around and he said, well, you got here pretty early. Uh, here, I'll help get you every, the office is closed, but let me go in there and get you a, a key. Let me get you this. Why don't you come and join us for dinner? I was loved and welcomed by Ken and by the whole crowd. They surrounded me and that Course in Miracles group from Oklahoma and Texas, they just had their southern accents and they just loved me and welcomed me and said, come on down to Texas, come on down to Oklahoma and see us. I just got swallowed in. And you know what the best part was? Was because I was just learning to practice the Course and I was graciously loved and welcomed and starting to meet a lot of mighty companions on this journey that were going to be reflections that it's okay to follow God and you can leave everything behind. You, 
you don't ever, like Francis said, you never really leave anybody because just when the form disappears, that's still your mind. They're, they're still in your mind. They're still with you. The love is still there. It's just the past associations, these past memories of who they are as being bodies and people, that's going through a major rinse. So that was the beginning for me of, a, of a, an amazing journey. That was, that was back in in 1990, and now here we are, uh, 30 years later, we're just heading into 2020, so that, that's about 30 years ago was that experience I just shared you from the Parable of David. What happened from there is, I just started to listen and follow, and go where I was guided to go. When you have a strong feeling to go and do something, and it's really strong in your heart, you need to follow that. You need to do what Joseph Campbell called, follow your bliss. Of course the ego is going to try to stop you with all kinds of thoughts of the past. Past association, doubts. You're going to let this one down, you're going to let that one down. If Francis and I had, had been paralyzed with believing that there was something external to us that was attacking us, that something external to us that's terrible or bad could happen to us, if we followed our heart, we wouldn't have followed our heart. It takes faith to follow your heart. It takes faith to jump into this, this journey and follow the Spirit. You have to really say, I'm all in. You've got to really say, I'm going to follow this and I don't know where it's going to go. I had no clue, and Francis had no clue at the beginning. We simply felt something calling us, God calling us in our heart in such a strong way that we couldn't say no to it. Believe me, I tried for some years back, I'd say in the, in the 1980s, like around 1984, I started to get this calling, and I tried to stuff it down. I tried to turn, turn away from it. And it hurt worse to try to deny the calling. And when I finally gave into it, it just has been like a rocket. It's just taken my mind higher and higher and higher and higher, just because I would listen to the guidance and follow. Listen, follow. Listen, follow. Ego throws in all kinds of objections. Yes, thank you very much for sharing, but listen, follow. Jesus is my teacher. Thank you very much, ego. And yeah, thank you for all those attack thoughts, and, and yep, go ahead, come on out of your hiding space, your unconscious hiding space. You're not real, and I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going for the miracles, and I want to have my perception expanded, not stay stuck and contracted, believing I'm just a lone person in this world, lonely, separate, and afraid. Sorry, that's not my calling in this lifetime. I'm... I'm here to go way, way, way beyond that. When I read your questions, I see that everybody that's written in has, has things that are, that are tempting. I mean, Anna Diliberti, you know, you've talked about, you know, your 58-year-old mother of two amazing young adults, Philip and Judine. You have a wonderful husband. You know, you have cats and dogs and gerbils, guinea pigs, birds and hamsters that have surrounded you and, and been part of your, your healing lessons for 30 years. You're a psychotherapist. And then you went down to Peru in the, the jungles of Peru and you had, took some ayahuasca and suddenly, whoosh, you had an experience with the ayahuasca that, that no, the things that you think you are is not who you really are. Uh, even when you came back to do your psychotherapy, you know, and you're doing, working with clients every day, doing the psychotherapy, uh, the voice inside of you is not so fast, Anna. You don't really believe in depression, anxiety, and all these other things, do you? And then your ego says, yes, of course I do. I suffered them all at one time, and so I can certainly help these poor souls, right? Spirit. No, no, no. This is not about helping suffering souls. This is about accepting your function as 
healing and forgiveness and letting your mind be healed. The reason you're perceiving per suffering souls, suffering people, suffering bodies, psychologically or physically is because you're not accepting who you are, you're choosing the ego's filter and you're, you're misperceiving yourself and everyone through this fragmentation filter. It's like you're looking through a kaleidoscope of guilt and you're just perceiving the suffering and sickness all around you in your whole world. This is a perceptual problem. So, Anna, you know, here is, is basically saying you were frightened by doing the workbook lessons. First time you did lesson number one, I put it down, petrified, knowing I would get back to it, but so freaked out that I didn't pick it back up for two years. I couldn't. Every time I looked out the window, I felt so sad, as I knew it was not real, but at that time I could see the beauty in it. So, there's this feeling of, oh no, don't take this away from me. I had a student years ago and, uh, who became a teacher of the Course, and then um, I remember we were both speaking at a conference in Cleveland, and her husband, uh, as I was passing through, he said, David, don't take my grandbabies away from me. That's what he said. And I was just like, I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody. I'm talking about eternal life. I'm talking about living an inspired life where you can shine and bless everyone that you see equally with the light of Christ. I'm not talking about taking anything away from you. So, I love it. Anna, you, you have poured your heart out. Basic questions. Did I understand it correctly when ACIM says we have never left God? We are merely dreaming we have. That's correct. It's just a dream. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, there is no leaving the Source. You, it's impossible to leave God. That's what the Atonement is teaching. The Atonement is teaching that the separation never happened. Isn't that a lesson you would like to learn? You know, can I see some hands? Is anybody else interested in learning that it's impossible to leave God? <laughs> you know, I think that's a lesson I, I'm very excited about, you know. I can't help it. I think about that every day. I'm, I just go through my day with such gratitude and happiness that, that I can't leave God. That's good news for me. Question two. Why would we choose to want to be separate from God and go into this dream state to experience individuality and separation? Well, that's that ancient choice that Francis talked about, and I'll tell you what. Jesus says this, the ego will ask, he says this in the clarification of terms, the ego will ask many questions that this Course has no answer to, or answer for. How did the impossible happen? To whom did the impossible happen? And many variations. But Jesus goes on to say, an experience will come that will end your doubting. He doesn't say, an intellectual concept will come to end your doubting. He doesn't say a theology will come along to end your doubting. He doesn't even say a book will come along to end your doubting. He says an experience will come along to end your doubting. So really, only the ego would say, why did the separation occur? Because the ego is separation, so it likes that question. You know, there's no intellectual answer for that. And Jesus did tell Helen Shuckman, the scribe of A Course in Miracles, and Bill Thetford, her collaborator, he said, he said, you asked this question, but he said, you can tell by the way that you feel, your emotional roller coaster ride of emotions, that you believe that it did happen. And Jesus is teaching us that this belief in separation and all of the images and memories of time and space and history that seem to be part of this belief only seem to you to be real. Of course, a way shower has to go beyond the, the trap and, and, and teach you that love is real. The same thing that Elenita, Elenique was being told by her, the voice of her 11-year-old son, Mom, only love is real, only love is real. That was Elenique's call to get into the Course. Through her son's voice, her son who had passed away, her 11-year-old son, that was Jesus 
calling Elenique back to the truth through the voice of her, her son. And what this is saying is that this is a dream world, and yet the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made, which is time and space, to reach you in your consciousness and call you to wake up from this fragmented perception. So, there's no intellectual answer to why did the separation happen, because the atonement is, is an experience of such joy, such glee, such happiness, that you actually realize that the separation never happened. You actually realize that the ego and this world of separation is impossible. You, it, you are very happy, you are consistently joyful and peaceful in this state of mind because of the atonement. Of course, if you accept the correction, don't you think you'd be happy in the correction? Living the correction, isn't that a better way to live your life than trying to live death, a death wish? A belief that you can separate from God. Question three, am I correct that God doesn't even know that we're dreaming this dream of separation from Him? Yeah, who's the we? You know, God is pure love, Christ is pure love, and it's a good to question the we. Who is the we? Where did this collective we come from? This we-we is basically the ego. And if you try to find answers to this course through the wee-wee, you know, it's like, as a little child would say, that's like trying to find it in the pee-pee. Don't try to find the wee-wee in the pee-pee, please! It's urine! It's, it's, you're just letting go of waste! Don't look for wisdom in the wee-wee or the pee-pee. You know, I'm trying to keep this really simple in child language, but no, God is pure love, and God doesn't know of the dream, but the Holy Spirit perceives the error, but it knows it's not real. The Holy Spirit looks beyond the error of separation. That's why the Holy Spirit is our guide, because he's not fooled by this trickery of, of ego separation. The Holy Spirit knows you as the Christ. The Holy Spirit knows you've never left God. The Holy Spirit is the remembrance of God. And while you're unwinding from ego perception, it's the Holy Spirit and Jesus that are giving you your instructions. Like in the Matrix, go here, go there, talk to so-and-so, call them up, tell them, tell them you were mistaken, show your love, express your love, don't be limited, don't hold back of your love. You've got so much, a storehouse of love to give away, and you can't know that you're really love until you give it away. So, that's important. Uh, number four, are we truly sinless? Of course, sin is, is the belief in separation, but sin is just an error to be corrected. It's, it's not real. Uh, if, if sin were real, then hell would be real. If sin were real, then the devil would be real. If sin were real, then it would be pretty hopeless, because that would be like, you did something really bad, really wrong, and now you're paying for it for all of time. Uh, you just keep paying for it one guilty experience after the next, like paying the ego's belief. But sin is just an error not only to be corrected, but Jesus and the Holy Spirit have already corrected it, and now our only function is to accept that same correction as Jesus did, and no wonder he was so happy, and he said, before Abraham was, I am, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. He was in the correction. He was living the correction. He, he was blessing everybody. Forgive, forgive everyone, you know, forgive your enemies. Love your enemies, you know, because he knew that there really were no enemies, that there was nothing that could touch the Christ, because God created the Christ. He wasn't identified as a man. He wasn't identified in time and space. He was the I amness that all of us are. So, are we truly sinless? Jesus tells us in the Course, you are innocent in eternity and guilty in time. Why am I guilty in time? Is because the ego invented time and the ego invented it as a trick to keep itself, to perpetuate itself. But, but eternity is real, just like we heard before. Love is real. 
the summation, the a whole summary of a course in miracles at the introduction is nothing real can be threatened. Spirit cannot be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That love, the Beatles had it right. All you need is love. We knew that. We we knew it when we heard the song. The Beatles had it right spot on, and we knew it in our hearts, and we went, okay, that's that's the truth. Thank you, John, Paul, Ringo, George, for, for being witnesses of the truth. All you need is love. So, if, am I correct that God doesn't even know that we're dreaming this dream of separation from Him, that it's all an illusion that each of us has created? No, each of us don't create anything. People don't create anything. People are part of the projection. The Spirit, the spirit doesn't live in people. The Spirit is totally beyond time and space. In fact, the Spirit, the I Am Presence, is prior to time. So time seems to go forward, but actually when you start to forgive, it's going to roll up like a carpet, and it'll just finally roll up, and then boom, you're back to where you always were. Like in The Wizard of Oz, you know, Dorothy, she has a dream that she leaves Kansas and she goes to Oz. And when she finally makes it back to Kansas, she sees Aunt Em and she sees all the people, and Toto's there, and she's so happy because all of her beloveds are there with her. And she's, she's always been at home. She just had a dream about going off to the land of Oz. There was a wicked witch. That was a good projection of the ego. Wicked witch of the West. Flying monkeys that would steal people. You know, that was a, I remember as a child I was quite frightened by the Wizard of Oz. And, and the mind that falls asleep and forgets God gets very frightened in this world of these projections. Is very frightened of the projections. So we are truly sinless, but you have to understand that as long as we believe in anything of this world of time and space, that's what generates the guilt. Jesus teaches us in Lesson 133 of the workbook, I will not value what is valueless. But he doesn't stop there. He tells us, he gives us a little sermon on telling the difference between the valuable and the valueless. So he gives us a great lesson. I will not value what is valueless. And then he tells us, if it will not last forever, it has no value whatsoever. And if it will last forever, it has all value. That's the first criteria for telling the difference between the valuable and the valueless. Now you may look around and you may say, I look at my children, I look at my husband, I look at my apartment here in New York. I, I look around at my life as a psychotherapist, and whoa, what a trip. You know, I, I remember reading some parts, you're, you're wondering, why am I going through the day? I feel like sometimes I just like to, to sit, go sit under a tree. Uh, am I talking to these people that are around me, and are these people even real? Is this person even real? You're, you're starting to really ask some deep questions, like you've poured your heart out. Pages of great questions, I have to admit. I love it. I love it when somebody really speaks what's on their heart. You're saying, your children, you talk, you talk about some of this with your children, and your children think you're crazy. What did Francis say earlier, you know? As soon as she started to get into the tractor beam of love, her husband and her mother, who weren't even close, they started to jump together like to team up on her. It looked like Worldwide Wrestling Federation. They do a double team on her to stop her from calling. They're trying to pin her to the ground, both of them jumping on her like, you ain't answering no call. What's so good in America? Why, what are you going over to see this guy, David Hoffmeister? Who is he? We've got, we've got better than David Hoffmeister in Australia and China. We've got a lot, a lot of people here in China that are a lot better than that. You've got to go see some balding guy over in, in the United States in Utah in the desert. Like, you've really lost it, sister. They're trying to pin her down to the mat. She's like, no, no, no. She's a fierce one. Francis was a fierce one. Okay. So let's go on. You wrote a few questions in here. Okay. Um, Question number five. When these questions arise, I start to wonder, am I really here? 
Do I have my children? How and why would I be creating all this? What was my orig original intention for all of this? Is any of this really happening? And then you start to get off into all kinds of ego questions. These are like ego metaphysical questions. So did my kids dream the dream that they would be my children at the same time I decided to have them? Our ancestors, knowing each other in heaven, reuniting with those we've loved on this planet even real? How can it be at all if this is an illusion? Good question. That's the last one. How can it be at, at all if, of this is, if it, this is an illusion? Now, suppose there's Jesus telling you that the world is an illusion. Now, how does that practically help you in your daily life? Uh, I remember I had a friend, Resta, one time, and she was, she was reading the Course, and she was working on Lesson 132. She took a walk in, the, in a cemetery nearby my house, Peace House, in Cincinnati, and she's walking in the cemetery, and she's listening to my talk, and then she's listening, and she's going through Lesson 132. And in Lesson 132, Jesus says the word, there is no world apart from what you think, and then he comes right out and he says one sentence from Jesus, there is no world, exclamation point. So Jesus puts those four words together in lesson number 132, there is no world, exclamation point. He has the audacity to put an exclamation point after it for emphasis. So my friend Resta is in the cemetery walking around and then she always comes to my kitchen to have a cup of tea and tell me what's on her heart, like you. She comes and sits, have a cup of tea with me, pours out all of her heart like you did, and she sits down and she's, she's really upset this day, this, this particular day. She's really disturbed, and she looks over at me and she goes, Jesus has really done it this time. And she's miffed. She's really upset. And I said, what did Jesus do now? And she said, he's, he's gone off his rocker. He's gone, I mean, I'm doing his course. But, I mean, he's lost it. He lost me today. He said, there is no world, exclamation point. Like, I, and she said, how is that practical for me? How does that help me? How, how does that actually help me? She said, he's gone too far. So I, I talked with her and I explained things to her and let Jesus come through and calm her down a little bit here. And it's like, just calm down, calm down. That's an experience, and you're not quite ready for that experience yet, but here, let's talk about things real practically here. I'm here with you right now. And so she had a calm talk, we had a cup of tea, she relaxed, she got centered and everything, and then she was like a channel for Jesus, that she would go in the other room, and she went back to go on the toilet, and she started to receive these songs from the angels. She got, she got like a hundred and... 170 some songs, I think, from the angels, direct songs with two and three part harmonies, like they were giving her a whole pathway to God came through Resta, through these songs. And she goes off and then she comes back and she has her little recorder and she's recording this song that the angels are giving her. And this was the angel's answer to her, Jesus has lost it. They gave her a song called, There Is No World. And this is how playful Jesus is. First she freaks out and blasts Jesus for going off his rocker, and then she calms down, joins, and the angels give her this song. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the beginning of it. It's called, As If There Is No World. As if there is no world, as if there is no world, a cosmic dream, a made-up scheme, where figures dance and swirl, and nothing means a thing except the truth within, that I am mind by God defined, designed. He's calling me to live as if there is no world. And then it goes on. No longer will I see that that the images define me. No longer will I try adjusting to a lie. He, he gets, it's not just one stanza, it's just like it goes on and on. Second stanza, third stanza. This is all for free on the internet if you want to go to musicofchrist.net. I put it up there many years ago. The whole pathway to God 
is on musicofchrist.net and all of these songs that Resta received from the angels. Because when she came in and she was angry at God, and she looked me straight in the eye when we're having our cup of tea, and she said, how is this practical that Jesus says there's no world? What came out of my mouth was, he's just asking you to live as if there is no world. He's asking you to live in peace and shine the light. He's asking you to live with your mind freed of all these concepts, emptied out from all these concepts and beliefs of who you are. He's asking you to be the light of the world. He's asking you, your mind, not you personally, Anna, but he's asking your mind to be the light of the world, to join with his mind, to let the light shine, to not take any of the roles seriously, to not take any of the positions seriously. You've written in here that some days you feel like you're just going through the motions when you go to work as a, as a psychotherapist. Um, that basically you really try, you say, I try to stay out of the past and the future and be in the now. My work, however, makes that difficult because most every client wants to discuss their past in order to get what brings them to see me, to get to what brings them to see me. So here's a job, a psychotherapist job that you have now. You've already had your ayahuasca experience. You've already had a glimpse that there's a voice within you that, and you've had a glimpse of the real you. And now you watch yourself as a psychotherapist every day going through these uh, discussions and maybe the things that used to be seem like they were helpful coming out of your mouth, uh, now it's starting to get a little bit like blah, 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 blah. Like, like wait a minute, where's my joy? I, I'm not experiencing joy, but I have a job, I have a career, I have to fulfill the requirements that I agreed to when I signed my employment contract, and da 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 da. And you're saying, my work, however, makes that difficult, the present moment difficult, because every client wants to discuss their past. My only, I have no desire or passion anymore to talk about those things. My only desire and when I come, is when I come alive and feel as though all of it, whatever it is, is effortless, is when I'm sharing my heart, God, and that they don't have to fear because even that is an illusion, that we actually never die. So the truth wants to speak through you, and you still have a self-concept of a psychotherapist, which is still part of being an unhealed healer, but what is an unhealed healer except a call for healing, a call to know the truth? And that's why I was sharing with parables from my life, and Francis was sharing from parables, that we have to be so faithful that we're willing to listen and follow, that we're willing to let go of anything that we're holding on to. And that means everything. In terms of my life, I... In the parable of David, I was having so many miracles back in the, the late 1980s. It was just me and Jesus in the course, you know, and really going deep. But I thought, I'm going to have to let go of this self-concept I have with my grandmother. I'm going to have to let go of this self-concept I have with my family. I'm definitely going to have to let go of this self-concept I have with academia after I've come out of 10 years of full-time university. I'm going to have to let go of my ambitions for the future. Uh, my ambitions of the kind of life I envisioned for David, uh, my envisions of, of, of meeting, of having a girlfriend or a wife or a soulmate. I'm going to have to let go of all of the things that I had ambitions for in the future that I thought would fulfill me and realize that there's a decision I'm making in my mind and then I need to learn how to decide with the Holy Spirit. I've been having a, a rough time of it, and I feel like a fish out of water, like you felt disoriented, and you felt like, is this even real, and is this surreal dream that I'm having? I would rather sit under a tree some days than go to work and play this uh, psychotherapy 
psychotherapist stick anymore. I, I'm getting sick of the stick of the, of the, of the act. And I, I don't want to act anymore. I don't want to be an actor. I want to be who I am. And so you start to say, my only desire is, is really to share my heart of God. Now, I have worked with people over the years, for the last 20 years, where I've lived with them, I've joined with them every day, and this is the kind of things we discuss. I've worked with CEOs of companies who have gone through dismantling. I've gone through people who realize they have a, a big heavy mask as a teacher concept, and they're not happy. They become such an intellectual teacher of the course that they know it like the back of their hand, and they can recite the book, and they can recite scripture from the course, but they're not happy. What, what good is your life if you're not happy, if you're not joyful? Even a Course in Miracles teacher concept, you've got to let go of that one eventually. That's just one that Jesus uses to kind of help you go up the ladder of consciousness. But you're, you're so vast, you're even more than a miracle worker. You're more than a teacher of God. You're the Holy Christ that, who's dreaming that he, he's a woman with some children and a husband in an apartment in New York City, <laughs> or in, up in New York. And believe me, there's a big gap there between what's, it's not a real gap, but it's just a, a perceived gap between what you believe and what is true. I have good news for you that I've worked with people who go through dismantling of careers, dismantling of families in their minds, dis dismantling of partnerships. Things fall apart. It's entropy, if you know anything about science. It's a big, giant entropy uh, because this world is based on the belief in, in separation. What else could it be? What else would you expect of, of a death wish except entropy? When I read about entropy, I go, of course. The world's all chaos and destruction. What, what else would you get from a, a death wish? God didn't create this world. This world is a projection of the belief in separation. So, this is what I love. You say, I, I think I'm just missing some pieces to this puzzle, or I've misunderstood something, so I'm asking you with much love, respect, and gratitude if you could help me understand this better. Well, Anna, yes, I am a lifelong companion with you. I, we have been brought together by Jesus Christ for the experience of the wake-up. I have no other desire in this world than to extend the helpfulness of, of answering the call. This figure of David is like a little pointer pointing to, to the light, but, but the figure of David is just as much of the dream as the book, A Course in Miracles, is part of the fabric of the dream. But that call in your heart is touching you, and it won't go away, and you won't actually find fulfillment and happiness until you answer the call. I might remind you of a parable that happened many, many centuries ago called Siddhartha. And Siddhartha basically was living in a palace and he, he was supposed to be the king, but he just couldn't accept that that was his, his destiny, just to be the king. It's, for some people, they would love to be king of a kingdom on earth, you know, run the show. But just so happens that, that this beautiful music started playing and the whole palace and the whole village fell asleep. And him and his trusty companion and his horse, they left and he went on a journey to find enlightenment, to find the Buddhahood, and to let go of all the sleep and mesmerism that seemed to be his daily life on, on, on the planet. He he was destined to be king, but he knew that that wasn't his true destiny. Because who we are is not a king on earth or a queen on earth. Who we are isn't some manifesting person who learns how to use the power of their mind to make different illusions. Who we are is that which transcends illusions, that which is prior to illusions. That You're not going to hear this from a lot of Course in Miracles teachers or spiritual teachers because I'm just telling it as it is. This is just the straight, plain, simple truth. You will never be content with anything except knowing who you are as the living Christ. 
it will always feel like a, a little, like the princess in the pea. You always feel that little pea under all those mattresses. You always feel like, like the matrix, Morpheus tells Neo, it's like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. That little splinter is clouding your vision, is making your eyes water, is distorting your perception, because the ego made this whole world up out of that little splinter of this tiny little sliver of a belief, tiny mad idea that you could be separate from your source. So I thank you, Anna, because that's why we have these retreats. That's why you're going to be able to watch this movie and see what I'm talking about acted out in the movie uh, this afternoon, which will be helpful because it's good to have examples of watching people give their heart over to something and seeing them go through a, a dismantling and seeing their prayers answered. And your prayer has been answered, not just for me, but you are, you have done this I could turn this into a book, actually, and it would probably, I don't know if it would be, be a bestseller, but it would, it would be a very helpful little instruction manual on waking up, because you've, I couldn't even get through all of your, uh, your questions. I just, I just scratched the surface there. But I, I offer my gratitude and thanks to you for, for being so open about all this, because your questions are everybody's questions. And you will start to have miracles that will, that will wash away the questions. You will actually start to come more and more into a still mind, like you had in that ayahuasca experience, that you will come into that very consistently, and the questions will get rinsed away. But right now, your questions are serving the whole plan of awakening, and you've, you've just uh, done a great, great service. Oh, I love it! I've still got over 18 minutes to answer more questions. Okay, I'm just going to start really rifling down through here. Malfred, yep, you want to live a life without compromise. Yeah, I've been talking about that. This, this is the answer to your prayer. Um, Alan, basically Alan's writing in, I've got to get through. Alan's saying that now that he sees that it's starting to see that he has resistance to it being a perceptual problem, Alan Wilson from North Carolina, now you're starting to, you're really getting to the core of it because that's the only admission you have to make is that, that you have to say and mean I have a perceptual problem before the Holy Spirit and Jesus can really kick into full action. Because as long as you think you have all these other little problems in the world, you know, you, you'll try to solve those problems and you won't get back to a perceptual problem. Let's just answer that with some some psychology. What is psychosis? Psychosis is a break from reality. So if, if you're perceiving a fragmented world with separate people, places, things, and circumstances, that's psychotic. So, so anybody here have psychosis going on? Does anybody here see that they've had a break from reality? Uh, you, you study these things. Grace, you're a doctor. You know, you've studied these things. You know, put your hand up. Psychosis. Psych a psychotic break. Yeah, there we go. We have to first admit that we have a perceptual problem. Number one, we've got psychosis going on. Psychotic break from reality. Reality is heaven, and this world is not. So right away, that's an admission that there's some psychosis going on. So it's fine, you know. Don't worry about the diagnosis, it's just temporary. Okay. What about schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is when you hear multiple voices. Do any of you hear multiple voices, like people in your world that are telling you different things? You know, like Frances was talking about. Her, her mother and her husband, Tim, were part of the, the schizophrenia. She was hearing multiple voices. Thank God she just listened to one, and uh, that kind of cleared the schizophrenia. But Schizophrenia is when you listen to multiple voices. And I could go on. I could use a lot of other uh, categories, but basically, Alan, is, if you just have the faith and let the dismantling occur and actually admit that you seem to be not experiencing consistent peace and happiness, and you're willing to be shown the way, 
that willingness will take you all the way back to heaven. Because that little willingness joined with the Holy Spirit's immense, enormous power, that's a, that's a powerful combination. So, you're on your way. Daniela. Oh yes, Daniela, I just was on the, a video chat with you from Colombia yesterday, wasn't it? With your boyfriend who's afraid of you coming to Mexico for a retreat. Uh, he was asking me, is it safe? Yeah, it's safe all right. <laughs> this is, this is going to bring more safety to your mind than you could even imagine because you're opening to your divine guidance. But your thing was on cause and effect. You know, you said, uh, today my prayer is about cause and effect. I've been thinking about this topic a lot since my relationship with food seems to be hard and confusing. I understand intellectually that there is no relation about the food I eat and the weight of my body seeming to go up and down. But I don't believe it, and I really want to. Could you please talk a little bit more about this topic? I want to believe in quantum living. Yay! <laughs> quantum living. Thank you so much. A lot of love to everyone. So, for you, we could say that that all specialness involves the belief in causes and effects in the world. And so certainly around body weight and food, that's a false association that the ego has made to keep you feeling guilty, to keep you trying to control your weight. Why do we have to control our weight? Is because our programming teaches us that it's better to have a thin, trim, athletic, you know, muscular body than a fat, ugly, sagging, <laughs> overweight body. You know, it's, it's, it's a strong hypnosis that's telling us that we will be loved if we're thin and we're beautiful and we're athletic and muscular, and we won't be loved if we're not. I've actually been to Colombia quite a few trips. I've been to Medellin and Cartagena, I've been to Bogota, I've been down to Cali, when I went to Cali, I went down to teach A Course in Miracles and I was teaching classes every day and people would come up to me and they would say, David, you've come to Cali, the plastic surgery capital of the world. You need liposuction, David? No, I don't really need that. Do you need, you need uh, implants? No, I'm, I'm pretty good with all that stuff. But actually, Kirsten was traveling with me at the time and she was having all these body issues because um, she was kind of, she felt like she had her self-concept of being a teacher of the Course, so she wouldn't wear any kind of clothes that were revealing of her shoulders or her neck or her chest. It was, she was wearing sweaters, uh, and I said, uh, the, the people, the women are not relating to you down here, you're dressed up like Mary Poppins, you know, you, they don't, sweaters down in Colombia, they, it's almost like, what the... So finally, the Holy Spirit and Jesus had myself and my friend Lily Ramirez, who's still down there in Cali, take her out on a shopping trip to buy some outfits so that she could, people could relate to her more as, as when she was speaking. Uh, they couldn't relate to her with the sweaters. And then little by little she did it, and then she finally started doing some expression sessions with... Uh, with, with Lily and I, and she was saying, I think that some of this might be in her book, I Married a Mystic, but she basically was saying, I can't, I, I can't wear these kind of skimpy little things that they wear down here because I can't be a teacher of God if my nipples are showing. This is the kind of thoughts that the ego will try to use around the body to hold you back. And you're just on, you're just getting onto them now because you're starting to realize that Yes, there's a self-concept in there, and body image is very prominent on that self-concept. That's why the weight is so important, you know, and you go into it a little bit deeper. But as you start to answer the call and step into your function, that's where your true joy and happiness come in, because you're going to want to call forth witnesses in your mind that you're perfectly loved and lovable, just for who you are, for your beautiful heart, for the love that you share, for that 
beautiful Christ love, for that beautiful God love that wants to radiate through you, that's how we realize our true worth, because God created us as spirit, and we, we need to know that. So you're bringing up something that I, I hope when you come up and I meet you there in Mexico, you know, this is something that will be used for all those other people, too, that will be with us, because many people are going through a lot of guilt and shame around body issues, weight, uh, and you're maybe not choosing the all the things of the world to try to, to, you know, you're just using things like exercise and diet, uh, but you're also still believing in cause and effect, like, these things should work for me. Why do they work for other people and not for me? Whereas some people are going for the plastic surgery and the liposuction, they're more extreme examples of trying to use the things of the world, you know, to try to feel better. And that's more just an extreme example of how far the ego will go to try to take you away from the truth. So thank you, Danielle. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I've also got Sabine from Germany. Uh, Sabine, oh my gosh, what such a beautiful thing that you wrote, because Sabine and I have been in contact here for a while. And Sabine is retired now for about a year and a half, and she's on her awakening adventure. And she had read one of my Facebook posts about why not go to uh, take a bus trip through South America if you really want to dismantle your self concept. <laughs> That's so she's contemplating coming to Mexico uh, right about the time um, we're going to be down there. Uh, for the, the Mexico retreat, and she's wondering, now that she's ready to book her tickets, she's going to come to Mexico, uh, she's going to be down in Ajijic, uh, so Calico, are you ready to receive her? Both, both uh, Sabine and I are coming uh, to Mexico, to, we're going to have to have a powwow together, all of us, because Sabine's coming all the way from retirement, and she's her, the ego's telling her, oh, you're too old. David did this in his 20s, but you're too old to do this. And she's launching to come down there on the 15th of January to Mexico. She's got six, day, six days booked at a hotel in Ajijic. I'm going to be down there, too. That's about the same time I think uh, Daniela's going to be there. We've got people coming in from Brazil, from all over, the, lots of Mexican. There's a Mexican senator coming from Mexico City with his big white hat on. We're going to have a party down there. We're going to have a dismantling the ego party. So, Sabine, you know, Calico's waiting for you down there. I'll be down there shortly. We're going to have to come together and shine our lights because this is about following the guidance. And, and of course, the ego's going to tell you you're too old, you don't have enough energy. What's going to happen? You haven't planned your trip. All you've planned is your trip to Mexico, but, you know, this whole thing with South America and bus trip and everything. Daniela can probably give you some good tips on Medellin. You know, some, some nice people to meet that are miracle workers in Medellin. You see, just here, just online, already things are starting to unfold because... You don't even have to know what's going to happen on that trip. But I have to say, Sabine, you are really going for it in your retirement. You, you lived years with obligations and rituals and so forth, and now you are on the adventure of your lifetime to follow the Holy Spirit, to follow the prompts, to trust, and to, to go for it with everything that you've got and I, Calico and I are, and, and Daniela are just among the mighty companions that will be with you and watching you on this great adventure. So you wrote the whole thing out. Uh, I, basically, uh, this started back, a Zoom online retreat uh, took place in December of 2017 or in January of 2018, but basically I told... Sabine, I said, the branching of the road, read the branching of the road section from the course, and you are just about to go on the most glorious adventure 
of awakening in your lifetime. And I've seen Sabine in, in uh, the, the monastery, and I've met Sabine in different uh, times and places. Sabine's been to our Mallorca retreat over on uh, the island of Mallorca, over near Manicor. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, still got time. Helena Elias. Oh, there you are. Helena, you are exposing the ego in a royal way, and you're just sharing it all out. And my invitation to you is, go for it. Go for it. The things that the ego would use to try to scare you the most about sacrifice or loss or hurting people or letting people down. You've heard the parable of Francis. You've heard the parable of uh, Elanique. She's her, you have three, three boys. Her son passed away and came with a message. There is only love. And, and Elanique is ready to kick it into gear with, with that. If there's only love, and if I'm not fully experiencing that, then I must have the strength and the power to ascend. That's what Elanique took that message from her son's voice in the, in the dream. I must have the power to ascend. I know you have a great strength in you. I've felt it all along where it's like you want to rise up and cast off these things that have been weighing you down. You just went through a beautiful holy relationship with Lisa Windsor and then you noticed a, a bit of the mask still wanting to come in, the mask of minister, the minister mask or teacher of God mask and then now you're outing everything. You're just saying, no. It, it has to go way beyond this idea of trying to behave a certain way or look a certain way. I need, I need a context where I can expose all my private thoughts. I need a context where I can get into my function in the fullest way possible. And there, is there any reference for it? I mean, I think about Mary Baker Eddy. I was so inspired by Mary Baker Eddy, but she... she went through years and years and years of extreme suffering. She got married to a dentist. Um, that didn't work out. Uh, you were talking how you want a, a, a partner who reflects your deep devotion to God. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy's first husband, um, Pattison, you know, he, he was a good provider. He was, you know, this and this and this, but it was like there's something inside of her that was calling her back to God in such an extreme way that she basically had to leave Pattison. She basically had a child. The child was taken away by social services back in the day, uh, probably back in the 1800s, and was taken away, adopted by another family in the Midwest. I think it was Oklahoma. And, and so she didn't get to see that child until the child was a grown man coming back and part of a lawsuit against her trying to rip down her whole life's work of Christian science. Talk about a child coming back to try to haunt you. It was just an attack thought, you know, nothing more. But, but everything in the dream world will, if you let Jesus arrange time and space, it's going to be for the awakening. This is, is about loosening from the meaning given to these thoughts and images. It's not about letting go of love, it's about forgiving the blocks, releasing the blocks so you can fully experience all this love that's in your heart. It's like you have a calling and the only frustration is, is hesitation upon answering that call. And what you've done here is you've just poured it out. I mean, you just poured your heart out and you just said, here it is. This is the stuff that the ego doesn't want me to share, but I'm just going to, I'm going to out the ego. I'm just going to begin the process of, of coming out of the closet with my identity and starting to just say, I'm, these have to be fair, it has to be fair game for me to expose what I, I know is holding me back. Maybe there'll be ripples in the fabric. Like Frances had ripples. She had uh, her her husband and her, her mother doing an intervention, like, get back to time and space. 
but she wouldn't let them hold her down on that wrestling mat, you know. Okay, you got me pinned down at the shoulders, you got my torso pinned down, my knees and my legs are still free. <laughs> A little bit of release, release. I'm out of here, I'm out of here. You've got to go for it, you know. It's, it's the time. A lot of these, I, I saw with what Calico wrote, I'm thinking, it's time to take the leap. Calico, you'll never, you'll never heal Calico. The healing of Calico is, is like uh, the last stand at the Alamo. Uh, you know, it's like that. It's the mind. It's the mind that heals. The, the Calico is a lost cause. That you have to let that go. You know, there's no way you're going to heal Calico. And Helena, you're not going to have. You're not going to be able to heal Helena either. It's, the beautiful thing is it's the mind that's waking up, the mind that wants to know itself, the mind that wants to find the light. Christina from Alaska, Klaus, oh Klaus, you know, you followed Krishnamurti and, and there was a little bit of the twinkle and the sparkle, but, but you, you know, you got just hooked in, Klaus, you know, there's, there's, what you can talk, what you're going to see, the darkness or the light, and and when you got caught up into this thing of the guru and the teacher, and and a, a concept of being an enlightened man or enlightened woman, you know, they used to call uh, Krishnamurti, you know, he was the the chosen one, the the enlightened one, you know, that would that would light up the world. Men and women don't light up the world. The light is inside us. The truth is within. But if, you know, it's beautiful. You poured your heart out. You went there. You 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 wrote. You know, David Bohm, Krishnamurti. You gave yourself over, and then and then the decision came. No, you you were not to be the one that would extend Krishnamurti's teachings and everything. Big blow for the ego. You know, it's like, oh shucks, that was my chosen fantasy was to be the, the extension of Krishnamurti's teachings all over the world. And then you could have done the same thing that the Theosophical, he did with the Theosophical Society, you know. I renounce, I renounce my, my country, I renounce all teachers, you know, follow your heart, don't, don't follow a teacher, you know. But, you, your ego was hit hard. It was hit hard with that disappointment of not being asked to stay on in that way. And then you went back, you got married, you went off, lived in the country, looked for the simple life in the country, had a couple boys, and then another had, had a few marriages, four or five marriages, five children. You call them the secrets of the world. Yeah, those are the secrets of the world. I, you're not going to hear most teachers call wives, husbands, and children, secrets. But actually, wives, and husbands, and children, and time, and space, and all these specific situations that are part of the human condition, they're all secrets. They're all secrets we've been hiding from the Holy Spirit. We've been fooled into trying to find the truth in the world. We tried to find it in people. We looked for avatars. We look for messiahs. We look for teachers. We like to put them up on a pedestal, and then we watch them like we like to see them fall. We get our binoculars out. We watch them. Ha ha! There they go. There they go. They're tumbling down. <laughs> and then we we say, "Oh, that's a fake one over there." But actually, it's because we feel fake, because we believe we've left the Christ. We've left God. And so the ego generates an entire world of time and space so we can point a figure at the ones that are frustrated. I, I can totally relate to what you were saying. Most people say that when they talk about Krishnamurti. They said he seemed to have such a, a broad experience of everything, but he also seemed to have a bit of frustration that, that he was seeing, he was like in the eagle's nest, and he was seeing from the eagle's nest. And then when people would come, and he would come down from the eagle's nest to Brookwood or to Ojai and all the places that he, he went, he would, he would try to be with the people 
one time I, I watched a Krishnamurti video and um, it was all about dissolving fear. And I remember I, I watched the video, I was in Roscoe, New York, where Ken and Gloria Wapnick had their place, Foundation for A Course in Miracles. I'm in the, the, the sunroom all by myself. I pull out all these Krishnamurti videos and I put on one. It was called The Structure of Fear. If you ever get a chance to watch this one, and in this one talk, he dismantled the entire ego uh, in terms of taking you step by step. But they kept showing the audience, and every five minutes of the talk of the structure of fear, they would show Krishnamurti, and he'd be on his seat like this with his little twinkly eyes and talking, are you with me? Are you with me? And then they'd show the audience, and it was almost like what he was talking about was so deep that it was going over the heads of everybody in the audience. He would lose another uh, 200 people. Every five minutes he spoke, he'd lose another 200 people in the audience. And I was fascinated. I was watching this, and I thought, he is lighting my heart up with every word that he speaks, but it's because I'm ready. I think I'm just ready to hear the words. That's all it is. And so... What you showed me was your great desire, and I love that you contacted me, and I love you so dearly, but we together, you, Klaus and I, and all of us on this retreat, we are together on the great adventure of authentic awakening, where we can share all of our sorrows, all of our pains, we can share all of our ambitions, all of our things that didn't work out, we can share whether we've been married or not, or whether we had five husbands or wives, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, none of it matters. We are so beautifully innocent right here, right now, because of who is our source. And we're on to the ego now. Now we've actually come a long road, but we, have, we are now onto it in the sense that we are seeing it's tried to fool us into being guilty, and it's tried to fool us into trick us into following all these detours. But the ego's time is limited. It's on very, it's borrowed time that is actually running out. The clock is running out on the ego. You might feel from my joy that at the, the time is at hand, the ego is, is no more. The ego cannot stop us. And that's what we join in, all of us. We join in that the ego cannot hold us back. We are on the tractor beam of love and light has got us. We are being beamed up, whether the ego likes it or not, and it's kicking and screaming sometimes a bit because it's not so happy about the light. But perfect love does cast out fear. Okay, I have actually run over time, but I couldn't help myself uh, for, for all of you. Please, please, in, in a short while, please give yourself a little spaciousness and stillness to go into prayer. And then as we move into the next session, Francis is going to come in in a very, very prayerful way to set the table, to really help set your mind into a state of receptivity into a state of openness that you will be able to see in a much broader way than you have seen before, that, that your mind will expand through watching this movie. This movie was not made to be like a blockbuster movie. This movie is not an action-adventure movie. Uh, this is not a James Bond movie. <laughs> this is actually a movie that Jesus made using Francis and all these beautiful characters just for us, just for this moment, just for us to have an awakening experience. So thank you all for joining in. I love this straight talk. I love it when you give it to me straight. And I'll guarantee you, you can count on me to give it to you straight. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Uh, I was lit up last night, but I walked down the hall this morning saying, I am blazing, and we are all blazing, and we shall blaze our way into the light of truth. And so I will see you all and in just a while for this movie, and uh, 
Francis will, will take us through this whole thing, and I, I will look forward to hearing your expressions uh, after the movie, because I will be there all ears to hear what you saw in this movie. So thank you. Thank you all.